I have been a cyclist for years, um, and I've lived in many places, and I've noticed that um, cycling in Vermont for transportation has not really caught on um, like it has in a lot of other places I've lived, um, like New York City and Boston and, um, and in Europe. Um, and I think one reason is we live in a really hilly, hilly rural state. Um, and now there's this new amazing tool uh, called e-bikes, which I think could really, really be big in, for making it a viable transportation mode. Um, so I'm going to tell you a quick personal story uh, why I got an e-bike. Um, this is a picture of my car, and it's a perfectly fine car, um, but it is a total money pit. Um, I recently had a uh, had to replace the camshaft and get some new brakes, and it, together it was like 1,800 bucks. And I thought, oh my god, um, you know, what what a money pit. So. Um, of course, the average, according to AAA, the average cost of owning a car per year is $8,469. That's according to AAA. That's depreciation, fuel, repairs, um, snow tire changes, everything. It really, really adds up. So I thought, since I'm spending so much money on my car um, and I bought a bike for $500 like 15 years ago that I ride almost every day, um, why not spend more money on my bike? Um, maybe I would drive less. So I thought I'm going to get the most, you know, deluxe bike setup I can, um, because that's probably going to cost a fraction of what my car costs me per year. So what I got was I got this e-bike. This is a picture of my e-bike. Um, it is a Trek dual sport plus. They actually don't make them anymore. I got this about two years ago and, um, I absolutely love it. And I, um, definitely drive much less than I did uh, before I got it. And I'll explain why in a minute. But first, I'm going to take you through this bike and show you some of its features. Um, can you see my mouse? Yes. Um, so, so this is the electric motor. Um, and this is the battery. It's got a huge battery. Um, I, can, I have about 40 miles of range um, with this battery. And... Also, there's some features about this bike that makes it per perfect for Vermont. It's got, you know, kind of wide knobby tires, which is great for gravel roads or for maybe snowy and icy conditions. Um, it's got these shock absorbers. So, um, you know, I can go over, go over, go on gravel roads. It's really, really comfortably. Um, it's got really good disc brakes. Um, and it's got all these sensors. Like this is a little sensor. So basically the way this bike works is... Um, the more effort you put into pedaling, the more boost you get. Um, it's got a computer that gets information from these sensors. And, um, you know, so if you're if you don't really need much of a boost, you don't get it. But if you do need a boost, uh, you get you get a boost. So it's really kind of a miraculous machine, I think. Um, and this is a picture of the controller. Um, E-bikes typically have these controllers and it's got different modes. Um, you can just ride it off if you want a real workout. Um, eco, you get a little bit of a boost. Normal, you get more of a boost. And high is the really fun mode. Um, that's where you get the most boost. And you control those modes here with these little controllers. So you know, I'm constantly switching between like eco, normal, and high. Um, and it also gives you miles an hour. It gives you mileage. You get a lot of information from these little controllers. Um, so that's pretty typical with e-bikes. And there's really two main systems. There's the Shimano system um, and there's the Bosch system on, on e-bikes. Um, this is the Bosch system. So this, the controller is similar. You know, you control um, more boost and less boost there. Um, and the other thing I discovered when I decided to spend a lot more money on bikes um, is accessories have really come a long way. Um, this is a, this is a, a stem that is also like a shock absorber. And, you know, these are a few hundred bucks, but compared to a car, that is nothing. Um, and this makes riding around here on gravel much, much more comfortable um, with that with stems like this. And even things like um, carrying bags, you know, panniers. Um, this is the kind of pannier I got. And it makes grocery shopping really, really easy. You can put a lot of stuff in these things. They're waterproof. They they clamp on so they don't fly off. Um, 
you know, even clothing has gotten a lot better. Um, so all these things really make using bikes for transportation much more um, viable. Um, and lights have gotten so much better. Um, and this, my girlfriend actually just got one of these. This is an expensive light, you know, it's, it's a few hundred bucks, but um, the great thing is it wires into your e-bike's battery. So you don't have to worry about the light running out of, running out of batteries, uh, the battery running down. Um, and, you know, you can ride this with a light like this, you can ride on a gravel road in the middle of the night, which I've done many times. And it's like being in a car. Um, so I think that's just another example of technology that really makes this viable for, for Vermont, for a rural place. Um, so just to show you how e-bikes have really changed my use of bicycles, um, I live here um, right near downtown Bennington. Um, and I figure that with my regular bike, I average about 12 miles an hour. You know, obviously going down hills, I'm going a little faster than that. Going up hills, I'm probably going a little bit slower. But so on my bike, you know, my commute to work is five minutes. Um, I also go to the rec center a lot to play tennis, two miles, that's 10 minutes. And of course, it's a pretty big hill coming back all these places. So I might not be as likely to bike um, with a regular bike from tennis um, because of the hill. And the grocery store is four miles away. With a conventional bike, it takes about 20 minutes. And sometimes I go up to North Bennington or Bennington College um, to play tennis or to go to an event. Um, that's 30 minutes on my conventional bike. Um, so with an e-bike, I probably average about 20 miles an hour instead of 12 miles an hour. And that makes a big difference. You know, not so much to work. I, I save about two minutes on my five-minute commute. Um, to the rec center, it's six minutes instead of 10 minutes. Um, and of course, coming home up the hill, it's no problem. So I always take my e-bike now to go there. Grocery shopping, um, whereas it used to take 20 minutes, um, it's now 12 minutes and I can get up the hill, no problem with the e-bike. And actually, you know, 12 minutes is really about the same as driving um, because on the bike, I can take a shortcut over a bike pedestrian bridge so I can avoid all the traffic um, on Northside Drive. Um, and to get to Bennington College, now instead of a 30-minute bike ride on my conventional bike, it's only 18 minutes on the e-bike, which, again, is really not that much different from driving. Um, it's just been an amazing tool to get around town. Um, but the big change has been I can go many more places on my e-bike than I could on my conventional bike. Um, down here in Bennington, we live near the uh, Vermont, Massachusetts border. And um, I, uh, I never rode my conventional bike to Pownall. Um, I own a little Airbnb in Pownall, so I go there a lot. Now I always take my e-bike. Um, I go to Williamstown, Massachusetts a lot to go to the movies or go out to eat. Um, I never rode my regular bike there, not once. Um, e-bike, every excuse I get, I ride my e-bike. Um, 12 and a half miles, it's only 37 minutes on e-bike. and. Another destination in Massachusetts for me is North Adams. That's where my girlfriend lives. And she lives 18 miles away. Um, and she has an e-bike too. And we actually fight about who gets to ride to whose house because it's so much fun to ride between Bennington and North Adams on the e-bikes. Um, and it takes 54 minutes, which is, you know, that's a chunk of time. But it, it takes almost half an hour to drive there, actually, um, because, you know, you're going through some some – some traffic lights, um, and before driving, um, you know, you get there and after 25, 30 minutes in the car, you feel kind of crappy. When I get to North Adams on my e-bike, I feel great. You know, I've, I've gone on some beautiful roads. Um, my mind is clear. My body feels good. Um, it's just much more of a pleasurable experience than, than driving to North Adams. Um, so that's been a huge change. And this is a road that I take on the way to North Adams. Um, this is Carpenter Hill Road, and this is a huge hill. Um, this hill from the bottom of this hill to the top is like a mile and a half. Um, you know, if you rode a regular bike up this hill, you would be like throwing up by the time you got to the top. You have to be in amazing shape. E-bike, you have to be, you know, I get a exercise when I get up there, because uh, you still have to pedal an e-bike, but um, 
it's really no problem. It's really, really fun to ride up a mile and a half hill on an e-bike. You don't have to be Lance Armstrong, um, but you know, and you do get exercise, but you're not going to want to throw up when you get to the top. Um, and in Vermont, we have a lot of these really good, you know, gravel, low traffic roads, which are really great for e-bikes. So we have a lot of this infrastructure that's perfect um, already. And so just to get into transportation planning stuff a little bit, um, you know, a lot of trips in the U.S., 60% uh, of trips in the United States are zero to five miles. And I think a lot of us hope that um, micromobility can really handle a lot of those trips, you know, like bikes, scooters, um, you know, this is already happening in a lot more urban places. Um, and then five to 15 miles, now you can do ride hailing like Uber and Lyft. And so then they say, you know, 15 plus miles, you have car sharing, which is 15% of trips. But with an e-bike, I think that it's all different. You know, e-bikes, e-bikes cover all of these trips, right? Like anything zero, zero to 20 miles, in my opinion, is doable on an e-bike. Um, so all these modes <laughs> disrupt the car. And I think that e-bikes disrupt all of these, these other things. Um, and e-bikes, um, because they're so amazing, the sales have just taken. Yeah. I've really taken off. Yeah. Um, this is a this is a chart that shows uh, e-bikes annual e-bike sales in Europe. Um, so last year, um, you know, three million two hundred thousand e-bikes were sold. Projections are they're going to go up to four and a half million annual sales by twenty twenty two. And in the United States, they've really taken off. Um, they were just this year. They were up 84% in March, 92% in April, and 137% in May. And I know from some friends that e-bikes are so popular right now in the United States, you, can, you can't even buy them. Um, you couldn't buy them over the summer. Um, wow. And it's going to be, it's expected to be a $20 billion industry in the U.S. by 2023. And um, it's estimated that 130 million e-bikes will be sold globally between 2020 and 2023. Um, really taking off. So why do people uh, use e-bikes? Um, this is, this is um, a survey that was done by um, a, a, a group in Portland called Transportation um, Communities Survey. Um, so they, they, they surveyed 1,800 uh, e-bike riders. And so 60% of people said the main reason they, uh, is because they like e-bikes is because they live in a hilly area, so that's not, they know that registered with me um, because we in Vermont we live in hilly hilly areas, um, and people who get e bikes ride them much more than regular bikes. Um, so fifty percent before they got an e bike, fifty five percent of people rode bikes at least weekly. Before getting an e bike, after they got an e bike, ninety three percent rode weekly uh, at least weekly, and seventy four percent people said they did not need a shower after an e-bike trip. And that's another nice thing. Although you do get exercise, um, you know, you're, you're much less likely to be drenched in sweat, which I think is a reason that some people don't use bikes for commuting. Um, so that, that's another problem that it solves. Um, so I'm gonna talk really briefly about the different kinds of e-bikes. Um, there are basically three different kinds. Um, there's a class one, a class two, and a class three e-bike. And uh, class one e-bikes are probably the most common um, in the United States. So those, e those bikes you have to pedal. Um, and when you do pedal, you get a little assist. And as I said before, the, the harder you pedal, the more assist you get. And those, um, after 20 miles an hour, you don't get any assist at all. The motor just turns off. Um, so like on my bike, a lot of times I'm pedaling and I'm getting an assist and then I go over 20 miles an hour and then I, I stop getting any help. Um, class two e-bikes, uh, are not, don't have that computer. Um, it's just a little throttle. So you, you hit a little trigger with your thumb and you get a boost. Um, so these are much simpler machines. Um, if you go to, you know, like New York and you see a lot of, uh, like delivery guys whizzing around the e-bikes, those are really throttle e-bikes. And you do not have to pedal those if you don't want to. And they go up to 20 miles an hour. Um, class three e-bikes are exactly like class one e-bikes. You have to pedal them. Um, the only difference is that they go up to 20, 28 miles an hour. Um, 
the assist goes up to 28 miles an hour. And these class threes are really, really, really fun. Uh, my girlfriend has a class three. I have a class one. Um, and I ride her sometimes, and it is so much fun. Um, I, I sometimes have trouble keeping up with her when we're riding together. But other than that, um, they are they are great, uh, especially for long, long rides. Um, so this is this is what uh, another e-bike looks like. This is a this is a class one. Um, and, you know, these are not cheap. This one, I think, is about three thousand um, dollars. But the, what there's there's a couple of reasons why they're so expensive. One is you have to have this really sophisticated electric motor. A lot of them have this one has built in components like it has a built in light that's integrated with the battery. It's got it. It's got a built in tail light tail light. It comes with this rack that you can hang a, a bags off, a panniers off, has integrated fenders. And e-bikes have to be very good quality because you're going so much faster and they're so much heavier. So, um, you know, it's got really good disc brakes. Um, so this is what a, a class class one e-bike looks like. Um, so this is an example of a class two e-bike with a throttle. Um, it's just this little thing you hit with your thumb if you want to get a boost. And this is a class three e-bike. And you'll notice it really looks like the class one e-bike. There's no, physically, there's no difference. I think it's just how the computer is programmed, um, whether, you know, the motor kicks off at 20 or 28 miles an hour. Um, and the other uh, cheaper way to get an e-bike is they have conversion kits. Um, this conversion kit, I believe, costs between $250 or $500, and I think you can get them through Walmart even, um, and you can add it to any bike. So this is like sort of a low-cost uh, e-bike, and this is what it looks like mounted on a, just a regular bike. So you can, you know, you can buy a, a bike at, um, at a garage sale and, and get something like this for $500, um, really good low-cost alternative. Um, and then there's other things. This, this is an amazing kind of e-bike. Um, I have a friend who has one of these. This is called a Copenhagen wheel, and you can put it on any bike, and the whole motor, battery, controllers, uh, all that stuff is in this magic red disc. Um, it was developed by MI, some people at MIT, um, and it is amazing. And you control it with your smartphone, and it has torque sensors, so the the harder you pedal, the more boost you get. And the other amazing thing about this one is it has regenerative braking. So if you backpedal a little bit, you brake some, and it charges the battery. Um, they're really, really fun, especially for urban environments. I think they're probably not quite tough enough for our environment, um, but um, especially if you're going on gravel roads for miles and miles. But you know, I guess the point is, there's a lot of really amazing uh, e-bike technology out there. And e-bikes, there, there are so many different kinds now. Um, this is a company in England, um, Ghost Cycle. Um, I think this is a folding bike. Um, and they have e-road bikes. This here, the, the battery is integrated into the frame. They have many different kinds of road bikes that are, that are also e-bikes. Um, and you can see the motor is really kind of subtle. Um, and this is an e-bike. Um, the battery, the battery's in the basket. Um, and it looks like the motor is in the back wheel. Um, and this is another e-bike. It's called a, a, a Van Morph. Um, I think the battery is integrated into the frame. And you can see the lights are integrated into the frame. There's a front light there and a tail light there. Um, I think these are pretty popular in more urban areas. This is another e-bike by the same company. Um, and boy, e-bikes are great in snow. Um, if you have a, uh, a f uh, more of a fat tire bike with uh, tre good big treads, I love cycling in snow um, much more than in um, than driving in snow. I think it's a lot safer, um, and it's really a blast. Um, so, you know, there's no, there's really no, snow is not an excuse not, not to bike if you have the right equipment. Um, you know, I think e-bikes really appeal to many different demographics for many different purposes. Um, this is a mountain e-bike. 
Um, and, you know, people use them for hunting, for, I've actually hauled firewood on my e-bike. Um, this person obviously uh, uses it for hunting. Um, they're, you know, they're every continent, um, they are really taking off. Um, this is, you know, this is, can be sort of transformative, um, a transformative technology in so many places. And they're also great for cargo bikes. Um, if you've ever been to, uh, you know, like Amsterdam or Denmark or Germany, they, there are a lot of uh, cargo bikes are kind of like the SUVs there. And with an e-bike, you can really haul a lot of um, cargo or people. Um, this is another e-bike cargo bike. And I think this is just such a beautiful bike. This is obviously in Germany. Um, you can see the motor there and well, you can really carry a lot of stuff um, in this in this container. Um, and that looks like a really fun bike. Um, a lot of um, a lot of e-cargo bikes are replacing delivery vans in a lot of sort of traffic choke cities like London and Berlin. Um, even UPS, this is this you can see the guy pedaling. Um, and so those are those are some of the um, some of the the different kinds of e-bikes, and um, you know I want to talk just for a minute about how to get people to to get e-bikes. And we've had a couple of um, events down here. We call them butts and seats events, where everybody uh, we have a bike committee and people with e-bikes um, lend them out for short rides, and that's really a great way to convert people. Um, I think that. Once you try an e-bike, there's kind of no going back. You just you just want one. Um, <laughs> at least I did. Um, people try them and think that is absolutely amazing. I have to get one. Um, and so butts and seats events are really good. Um, another way to promote e-bikes are to have a, a bike share that has e-bikes. Um, and I think that they are going to have one in Burlington or they have one in Burlington. Um, I know they have a bike share there, but I think they're going to be replacing that fleet with e-bikes. Um, and another way to, to get to promote e-bikes are, um, are rebates. Um, actually, Green Mountain Power um, customers, you can save $200 when you buy a new e-bike. Um, so if you're interested in an e-bike, um, definitely look into that. Um, and... So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some barriers to uh, using this technology in our state. Um, so this is a map of the United States, obviously, of um, laws surrounding e-bikes. And this is put together by an organization called People for Bikes. And as you can see, Vermont, um, we are in the acceptable, <laughs> acceptable but room for improvement um, category. And I think the reason why we're not green is because our laws do not distinguish between the different e-bike classes. Um, and actually like Massachusetts is bad. Um, they have very antiquated laws around e-bikes where they really treat them like mopeds. Um, and actually e-bikes are not allowed on public uh, paths in Massachusetts, which is really a problem for us because we're trying to develop a bike path between Bennington and Williamstown. Um, so the way the law is now in Massachusetts, you wouldn't be allowed to ride any bike on a bike path. Um, and, um, you know, people do have safety concerns on bike paths, but the reality is, um, you know, you can, you, people, top, top speeds are probably going to be higher on a conventional bike, whereas average speeds are higher on e-bikes because once the motor kicks off at 20 miles an hour, um, you're riding a 40 pound bike and you're not going to be going very fast. Um, so I think the safety. The safety issue is really, um, it's really not a, not an issue. Um, so the other the other barrier we have is we have we have pretty you know we have really nice dirt roads and some nice roads in town, but really we don't have the infrastructure for for really getting a lot of people to cycle here. Um, this is a sort of a famous chart in transportation planning circles. There's four different kinds of cyclists. There's the strong and fearless. Um, this is this represents less than one percent of the people who ride bikes, and they will people like that will ride no matter what. You know, they'll ride down highways or any kind of traffic, no problem. Um, enthused but confident, people are people are pretty brave. Um, I'm probably in this category. This, um, you know, I'll, I'll ride pretty much anywhere. Um, 
not going to be put off by a lot of traffic, but 60% of people are what they're, what we call interested, but concerned. So they like the idea of cycling. Maybe they'll do a, a little bit, but they don't really feel that safe doing it, especially with infrastructure we have. So this is really our target audience. We need to make infrastructure here so that this group is really comfortable riding. Um, and until we do that, um, we're not going to get a lot of people on bikes. Um, and, you know, I think this is this we, we have a pretty bad safety record in the United States um, for cycling. Um, this these are this shows fatalities per capita. And as you can see, in the United States, uh, we made a few improvements in the 90s, but um, but safety has really leveled off and has actually gotten worse um, in the last few years. Whereas in a lot of European countries, safety has just continued to get better and better. Um, and, you know, boy, I could talk for hours about why that is, but um, it's unfortunate. And I really think it needs to change. Um, so, you know, and just getting back to this, this map um, of my trip to see my girlfriend, you know, a lot of the trip is really good. Um, it's on those great dirt roads, but then unavoidably you have to ride on route seven which is really pretty bad um not many people are going to do that um and then some pretty bad conditions here um so there's really no reason why you know this couldn't be a great trip the the whole way um if we had slightly different transportation policy um and i think it's getting there but uh but we need to make this happen faster um so i'm just going to give you a couple of examples of some really inventive infrastructure, the kind of infrastructure I think we really need some of to really uh, make this happen. Um, and, you know, this is, this is in Japan. Um, they have, there's a lot of bike paths like this. I just think this is just so, such a nice design. Um, it's right on this really steep embankment. You have these amazing views. I mean, who wouldn't want to ride, ride down that? Um, this is in Belgium. Um, you can see how kind of inventive you can make uh, bike infrastructure and how, you know, it's not like a highway, um, which, you know, highways can be pretty ugly. Um, you know, this is really, really cool, I think. Um, this is in China. Um, this just shows some of the creativity that the designers use to get across this kind of awful, huge new highway. <laughs> and this is a bike path. Um, this is also in Belgium. Um, Boy, it would be great to have some stuff like that in Vermont. I think that would really get people riding. Um, this is in Italy. You know, who wouldn't want to commute to work on this on an e-bike? Um, looks amazing. Um, and this is a shot of Copenhagen. And Copenhagen is a place that they have built a lot of amazing bike infrastructure. And as a result, you get more than 50% of trips in the city uh, by bike. And this is actually a pretty dated picture. They've They've, they've made these cycle tracks a lot wider, but it just shows you how it's really become part of the culture, um, the culture there where, where it's not here. Uh, but I think e-bikes could really make a difference, um, which is why I think they are perfect for Vermont. Um, so I will quit this and uh, we'll save that. All right. I'll shop is my I, I can't I think I stopped sharing screen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um so I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments about e-bikes. Um this is Mary, thank you. That that was a great presentation. I'm wondering if you use studded snow tires. Mm. Um I was actually thinking about getting studded, studded snow tires. Um I have a I have, uh, my tires are fairly studded and they're okay for some snow. When it's really, really snowy out, I have an old mountain bike that I ride to work. It's only, it's 1.1 miles to work, so it's not right. a big deal. But um, I love my e-bike so much, I kind of want to get another one too, um, with a sort of fat tires. Oh, a fat tire? Tires. I think that would okay. be really fun. Uh, yep. So I'm kind of saving up for that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Then I have another question. Um, if you were thinking that you would haul haul a load regularly, yep. like um, in other words, like a trailer with I don't know, groceries or kids or a business or whatever, 
what kind of parameters would you look for when purchasing an e-bike? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there, uh, there are some really good um, websites um, with with e-bike reviews. There's, yeah. Uh, I think it's called like ebikereview.com. There's a guy who goes around the country to bike shops and he um, he's very knowledgeable and he um, reviews e-bikes and kind of goes on a ride with his camera and talks about all the different technical specifications and gives you his opinion. So there's a lot of really good information on the web. So I would probably do some research and then I would go to a, I would test ride as many as I could. Um, I wouldn't buy one without test riding it, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Or, uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, my question is, um, how do you charge the battery? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so there's two ways of doing it. Mostly bikes, um, they come with a, uh, thing that looks like uh it's a charger you plug it in and um then you plug it into your bike battery either directly or you can take the battery off the bike um it's very easy you just there's a key and you just it just comes right off and you can take it up into your office and charge it um using the uh the charger um it's very simple that takes mine takes about two or three hours to completely charge it's pretty fast um so and, yes, you're on the bike or you can take the battery off. Okay, and related to that, does the battery ever run out while you're riding it? Okay, so that has happened to me once. Um, and uh, I went to my girlfriend's house and I forgot to bring the charger with me. So I had about enough charge to get halfway home. Um, so then I had about, I don't know, seven or eight miles to go without any charge. And, you know, you can still ride the bike, um, but you're riding a 40 pound bike. So I guess I got an amazing workout that day, um, <laughs> but I was able to get home. Um, but that was just, you know, my carelessness of forgetting my charger. Um, probably what I should do is I should get another one and leave one at her house so I don't have to keep lugging it back and forth. Um, yeah. So I have another question. Sure. No one else does. You know, the whole notion of incentivizing um, change to our bike pathways are, or our roads and our roads. Yep. How do you see us getting that done in Vermont? Um, well, I think, um, uh, I think that, there are a couple ways of doing it. Um, there's kind of like, there's there's two jurisdictions in Vermont. There's your towns and then there's the state. Um, in some ways it's easier to do it at the town level um, on town, town roads. Um, you know, then the people you really have to convince are the select board. Um, you know, VTrans, um, I think they're a little slow coming to, coming around on this. Um, in some ways, um, VTrans is a very typical uh, state DOT. State state DOTs tend to be much more conservative, and they tend to be run by traditional traffic engineers. And you know they do an amazing job maintaining our state highway system, but they're not so open to making roads um, accessible for for bikes um, and for pedestrians. So I think they're. I think that's a political a political thing. I think that. Um, you know, some of it comes from the very top, from the Federal Highway Administration. And, you know, now we have a new administration coming in. Um, maybe there'll, there'll be a change there, but it's it's really political. Um, and, you know, one of the amazing things about Vermont is Vermont, um, the state, I'm getting on my soapbox a little bit. They talk a lot about how, oh, we want to improve biking and all this stuff, but they spend almost no money on it. Um, boy, you know, I think the whole bike ped program is like, how much they spend on a couple of paving projects. So they really need to start putting their money where their mouth is um, and start building some of this stuff. And, you know, the, the health, the health costs, health savings alone would be huge. Um, you know, the state health department is really into this stuff, but 
for some reason, the um, V Trans is really, really behind the times. Um, so I'm hoping that the that there'll be more um, push from the federal government. Um, and um, I think really we just need to complain. You know, get an e-bike, ride it, and call them and complain about all the crappy conditions. Um, that's really how it changes. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Mark. It's Jason. I'm. I see a question from Diane in the in the um, chat. Uh, isn't e-biking dangerous in the rain? Icy roads would be really tough, right? Could you speak to that a little bit? Um. Uh. Well, you know. Um. I think they're they're play. I I've been riding my bike for transportation since I was fourteen, and um. I don't really mind the rain. Um, I think it really depends on um, your kind of tolerance for it. I mean, obviously, if it's really raining hard, it's not going to be that much fun. A little bit of rain is okay. Um, you know, places where cycling is really, really popular, like Amsterdam and Denmark, you know, it snows in Denmark. People ride. Um, <laughs> it doesn't stop people, um, you know. Um, Probably you're going to get fewer people when it's snowy. Um, icy conditions, yeah. I, I don't love riding in ice, but what makes what makes e what makes cycling dangerous is not the biking so much; it's the cars, right? So, um, you know, if you're taking a route that doesn't have a lot of cars or where the where the speeds are low, I think that's really the the way to go. Um, I hate right really the the thing that makes cycling dangerous are two things: it's speed and trucks. Um, a really high percentage of cycling fatalities are trucks um, and or cars going really fast. So my rule is I avoid roads that are 40 miles an hour or greater. Um, sometimes it's inevitable, but I really try to avoid those roads. And I, I, I am really, really careful around trucks and you have to be really visible, you know, really good lights and wear high vis and um, and. I, you know, I think it's it's not perfectly safe. Nothing around cars or trucks is perfectly safe. But um, on the other hand, you're going 20 miles an hour. You're not going 65 miles an hour. So there's some safety in that. Um, yeah. Martha, I see your hand up. Um, I was just wondering, does it make sense with bikes like it does with cars to have charging stations at popular destinations or do people just not plan trips that are longer than they can get there and back with their job? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, you know, obviously with an e-bike it's a little different from a car because you don't need any special infrastructure to charge an e-bike. Um, any outlet will work. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, um, you may not be going to some place that has, I think if it really takes off, then maybe there would be some facilities to charge bikes. Um, but the range is pretty good. You know, you get my bike, you can go 40 miles um, pretty easily. Um, yeah, that's something I hadn't thought of. Uh, I wonder what they do in countries where there's a lot more cycling, um, whether they're putting that in. I, I don't know. Yeah, interesting thought. It looks like we have another question from Diane in the chat. She's asking, is it easy to lock these bikes if you're in the grocery store? Could a 40 pound bike easily be stolen if there's not a good place to lock them? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. Um, I, uh, yeah, I have had many bikes stolen in my life, unfortunately. Most of them were, uh, I grew up here and then we went high school moved to Boston where I biked everywhere. And I think in four years in high school, I had like eight bikes stolen. <laughs> and then in New York, I had a couple bikes stolen. I've never had a bike stolen in Vermont. Um, and I think, so I just don't think there's, I don't think it's as much of an issue. You know, in the city, there's people actually going around stealing bikes. Um, they have the tools for it, but outside of Price Chopper or whatever, I don't, I don't, there, maybe there'll be a casual thief, but it's pretty low, low risk. Um, so my bike locks up just as well as any bike. Um, I have a big uh, U-lock that I use and I lock, the key is locking the frame to something that cannot be cut. Um, and you know, the battery, to remove the battery, you need a key. Um, and I usually just leave the battery on. Uh, if I was in, if I was in New York City, I might take the battery with me. Um, 
the batteries are expensive. They're about 800 bucks. Um, so that's not something you want stolen. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess, I guess if I were living in a big urban area, I'd be a little more concerned about it, but I'm, I'm not that worried about it in Vermont. Um, that's the, that's the long answer. Anyone else? Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a, a, a question. Sure. Mark, thanks for uh, the presentation there. And uh, I just purchased a uh, e-bike this fall, and I got to agree with you, boy. It's uh, it's been a game changer. I haven't yep. I I haven't uh, used the bicycle or for quite a few years and my wife and I both purchased e-bikes we're in our 60s and if it wasn't for the e-bikes we wouldn't be doing what we do now with them and stuff it's been a it's been a huge game changer and what i hope for in the state is that they'll uh start taking bicycling a little more serious like they do in europe like you were saying what goes on there and stuff uh, I think it would help with with our state as far as the environment goes. I think it would help as far as our carbon footprint go and our health and all those other reasons you were saying also. It's just a it's a it's a, it's a fantastic way to get around. It's a you, you start seeing things that you haven't seen in a long time and been on roads that you can really enjoy and travel on. I. Uh, it's hard with the state, it seems, with money that they put into bike paths and bike lanes on highways, like you were saying, that they don't they don't spend that much money on that part. And hopefully, as e-bikes get more popular and they're zooming up there as far as sales and interest and everything else that goes with it, that they'll they're almost gonna have to take a little more interest in it and and maybe spend some more money on it and stuff. As far as the charging part, I'm thinking maybe. They have the uh, chargers that they're putting in for cars all over the place. I mean, you, like you said, there there isn't much difference. All you need is a plug on those to so to incorporate a plug in a charging station. I wouldn't think that would be that that hard of a a thing to do. It is something that you could do uh, relatively easy on any future charging stations. Just have a plug there. I mean, that's all you need. You don't need that 220 volts. You don't need like cars doing everything else and stuff. And even our in our town in Chester, we have a charging station in the center of town, and it's just set up for cars. But I think we're going to revisit it to maybe at least uh, put an outlet out there, put a plug out there for people yeah. that have been cruising through and stuff, and they have to do what they could do. They could just plug it in and take off. But I just want to echo what you've said on all those points about e-bikes. It really, it's it's been a blast, and I can't wait for the spring. I'm a little shy with the winter time around here with the snow and everything, but uh, when the weather changes, hopefully uh, be back on the road again. And I think it's just gonna take people to speak to their, you know, politicians and, and, the, and the powers to be. And by example, when they, as it gets more popular, it, it, they're just you're going to have to accommodate them and stuff. It's just a, it's a great way to travel. I think it's a, it's, it's a great future too. So thanks for the presentation, Mark. Appreciate sure, it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah, and I agree. They are really fun. <laughs> That's the bottom line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're a blast. They're a blast. Yeah. It looks like. Oh, it's, I, I just want to show. Looks like Martha, you've got a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if. Maybe we lobbied the legislature to allocate the sales tax on bikes to infrastructure for bikes, if that might incentivize them to make the roads more friendly. Well, I think one thing to think about is, you know, the, the state gets a lot of money from the federal government for transportation, and they can choose to spend it how they want. Um, with, with some strings attached. So I think the money is there. Um, and bike infrastructure is so much cheaper than highway infrastructure. You know, in, in Bennington, we just built this bypass for $100 million, which nobody really around here even wanted. Um, so there's a lot of money, um, but I think maybe they just need to change a little bit how they spend it. Um, so. Yeah. Some, as if you link it to sales tax on bikes, then as more people buy bikes, use bikes, they'd see that going up. And mm. I mean, maybe they match it with federal highway funds. Yeah, or something that's true. Like that. 
Yeah, that's true. But yeah, but they we do get a lot of money for infrastructure here from the federal government, and it's important to keep that in mind. Um, you know, more per capita than uh, more urban places do, actually. So, all right. Well, thank you all very much, and um, feel free to email me if you have any questions about e-bikes. And I encourage you to try one if you can. Um, and you know, let me know how it goes. Hey, th oh. thanks, Mark. We, re okay. we appreciate it. Thanks a lot for the notice. Okay, talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye.